Hello. Hello and welcome to our continuing study of the book of Philippians. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to be here with you tonight. Tonight we're going to be in the fourth chapter. We're going to look at the eighth and the ninth verses. So I'm going to, I'm going to read those and then we will pray and then we will dive into the scripture. Philippians 4, 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I've titled my lesson tonight, Practice What You Think. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we give you glory, we give you honor this evening as we open up your word. God, I pray that you would speak to me in your word tonight, and I pray that you would speak through me to those that are listening to my voice right now. Let us all receive from you exactly what you would have us to receive, and we'll give you glory honor and praise in the lovely, lovely name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, you are what you think all day long. The wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, says the same thing in a little different way in Proverbs 23, 7. Solomon says, as a man thinks within himself, so he is. Paul David Tripp, more contemporary, tells us, you think. You never stop thinking. You think much more than you are aware of. Your thinking influences you more than you know. The moment you stop thinking, you're dead. So are you alive tonight? If you're alive tonight, you are dead thinking. Maybe you're thinking, is this all we've got tonight in our Bible study? I don't know. Let's dive in and see if there's more. But what do you think about on a daily basis? When your mind drifts during the day, 
Where do your thoughts take you? Where do you go? Paul begins closing this letter here in the 8th verse with that word, finally. That's kind of like when the preacher is preaching a sermon on a Sunday or a Wednesday or whenever, and he gets to that point in his message where he says, in closing. And when he says those words, a lot of times if you've allowed your mind to drift a little bit, when he says in closing, you kind of sit up, you pay closer attention, you zone back in to what he's going to say as he ends his sermon. And that's kind of where Paul is, I believe, in this letter. He's saying finally. So he's, he's really wanting the Philippian believers to zone in, to pay close attention to what he's about to tell them because he has some powerful, powerful words yet to say in this letter. Even beyond what we're going to look at tonight, over the last two weeks of this study of Philippians, some of the most powerful Scripture is there. Plus, it's also some of the most misinterpreted Scripture. So I'm going to encourage you to set yourself a reminder. Don't miss the last two weeks of this study in Philippians. You're going to have some great Bible teachers going to bring you some powerful Scripture, some wonderful truths that we need today. So don't miss the last two weeks. But Paul is beginning to close this letter, this wonderful letter that we've looked at over these, these weeks. This letter where it's full of rejoicing. It's full of Paul exhorting us to maturity, spiritual maturity. It's where Paul is encouraging the Philippians and he's encouraging us to stay on course. He's telling us that God is doing a work in each and every one of our lives, conforming us into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. So this letter, this powerful letter, He's going to bring to a close. As we look at verses 8 and 9, I do want to step back though, because Verses 6 and 7 of, of chapter 4 kind of lay a foundation that will help us to understand more fully what Paul's telling us in the 8th and ninth verse. So let's look back into verses that Josh brought us last week in verse 6 and verse 7. The Bible says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So Paul is telling the Philippians, he's telling you and me, not to worry. Don't worry. Don't be anxious about anything. But when you pray, make your request known to God. And when we do, when we make our requests known to God without worry, understanding that He's sovereign and He's in control, then the peace of God, which we can't understand, we don't comprehend, we can't grasp the vastness of it, that peace of God will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Guard. That's kind of a military term to guard something, to watch over something. The peace of God will watch over our minds. Well, what is it guarding our minds from? What is this peace guarding us from? John MacArthur and many other commentators give us a, a view as to some of the very important things that our hearts and our minds are being guarded from. Anxiety, which Paul has mentioned in the sixth verse, don't be anxious. So our minds are being guarded from anxiety, from doubt, from fear, from distress, from worry. These things weigh heavily in, in our world, in, in this society. How many of us suffer physically because of fear or anxiety, stress, worry? So many of our problems physically in this day and age are caused by these things. But Paul is more interested in something that's much more important. And that's not our physical bodies, but our spiritual bodies. 
You see, when Paul talks about the heart in verse 7, he's not talking about that muscle within our chest that's pumping blood throughout our body, keeping life within us. No, he's talking about something way more important. He's talking about that inner man that Thomas talked about a couple of weeks ago in a sermon, that inner man. Our heart, as Paul is expressing it, is that inner man, that spirit man, our souls, that part of us when this physical body is laid down in death, that inner man that Paul is speaking of will continue to exist forever in one of two places. That's what Paul is concerned with, is that spirit man, that inner man, our souls, that will never, ever die and never cease to exist. So he has tied our hearts and our minds together. And the peace of God is guarding our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So understanding that, let's dive into our two verses for tonight. Verse 8, Finally, brothers, and when he says brothers, some of your translations probably will say brothers and sisters, and we know he's including everyone in this because in the very beginning of this letter, in the first verse of the first chapter, his letter is addressed to all the saints, to all the believers in Philippi. So we know he's, he's talking to every one of us. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So Paul has given us a, a long list of things that we need to think about. So before we look at the list, let's consider what is Paul telling us to do when he's telling us to think about these things. Well, if you pick up an Oxford Dictionary and you look up think, it's going to tell you to direct one's mind towards something or someone. So you are focusing in on one thing or one someone. You're focused in on it, laser focused. If you picked up a Merriam-Webster, it's going to tell you to uh, add the words to consider or to reflect on, to ponder, to meditate. And some of your translations probably say meditate on these things instead of think about these things. And when we meditate on something, that means that we, we cast out everything else from our minds. Everything else we drive out of our minds and we or totally focused in on that one thing. Everything else has to go as we meditate on that one thing. Matt Chandler, a pastor in the DFW Metroplex, he explains it like this. He says that what we have to do is we have to constantly be exercising our minds on these things. And of course, if we are exercising our minds, the very the word exercise is telling us we are strengthening our minds and our hearts. Uh, another way you could say that, this is practice. We practice these things. But we're going to talk about practice here in just a few minutes. So as we are thinking, as we are meditating and considering and pondering, focusing in on whatever it is that's in our mind, we are feeding our hearts because they are linked together. They are synced together. Whatever we are thinking, we are feeding our hearts. It's just like if we eat good, nutritious food, we are feeding our bodies and, and it's strengthening our bodies and our bodies are healthy and we are benefiting our physical bodies. In the same way, in our thoughts, if we're thinking and meditating on these things that Paul is telling us to meditate on, to think on, then we are strengthening our inner man, our spirit, our soul. We are strengthening it. Strengthening it. We are, it's a benefit. We're getting stronger. If we eat junk food in our bodies, then it's going to be the, to the detriment of our bodies. Our bodies are going to be weakened. And if we dwell on the junk 
the mental junk food, as it were, then we're going to weaken our souls, our spirit man, our inner man, that man that will always exist. So what are we feeding our hearts, our souls? Are we feeding it the good or are we feeding it junk? When I was in college, way back in the day, uh, in computer class, computer science class I had, and yes, I know that was forever ago, but there were computers back then. There was an old saying, garbage in, garbage out. In order to get good data out of that computer, you had to put good, useful data in. And it's the same way with our hearts, our minds, and our souls. We've got to put good in to see good come out. Good in, good out, we might could say. And there is a battle raging. Make no mistake about it. There's a battle raging for our hearts and our souls. And if you don't believe it, all you have to do is turn on your TV, and I don't care what channel you turn it to. You can turn on to your 24-hour news station, and you see a battle raging. And that battle is for our hearts and our souls and our minds. You can turn on uh, whatever entertainment. I don't care if it's Netflix or one of the networks. Whatever it is, you can turn that on and there's a battle raging for your heart and for your mind and for your soul. You know, we can put on sports, of all things, sports. But even within that, we're seeing a battle raging for our hearts and for our souls. There's pressure on you and I to conform not to the image of Christ, but to conform to a popular, secular image. And that battle rages on. That battle is a battle for our minds. That's why we need the peace of God guarding our minds. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, he says, For though we walk in the flesh... <clears throat> we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. There is a battle, a battle for our minds, and Paul is encouraging us that we have to take every thought that enters our mind, we have to take it captive to obey Christ. There's a war. There's a battle. Who is winning your battle? What do we ponder? What do we consider? What do we meditate on? What do we daydream about? When our mind wanders during the day, where do our thoughts take us? Paul David Tripp, again, he says uh, some very pointed questions. What set of values determines your schedule? What view of life determines how you make decisions? What perspective about the nature of and purpose for your existence forms your everyday street-level priorities? How does your thinking shape what you do and say every day? You have only two choices. An on earth way of thinking that is all about this right here, right now, physical moment. Or an above way of thinking that looks at life from the vantage point of the grand redemptive story. And more specifically from the perspective of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's your choice? Is it material reality as the only reality? Or reality viewed through the lens of the radical truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Which is it for you where the rubber meets the road in your daily life? Two ways of thinking, on earth or above. Where are your thoughts? Here in verse 8, Paul gives us a road map for above thinking. It's his six whatevers. We'll call them the six whatevers. 
And I think there's a reason why he put that whatever is in front of every one of them to make them stand out and to emphasize that these are the things we need to talk about. His first one, whatever is true. What is true? That's an excellent question for us today. What is true? Jesus tells us what's true. His words are recorded in John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Once again in John 17, 17, Jesus says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And then Paul, as he writes to the Ephesians, in the fourth chapter, he says these words, Now this I say in testifying the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Here, once again, we see the heart and the mind. They're linked together because of their minds, the futility of their minds. Their hearts have been hardened and darkened. And this is an on earth way of thinking. 20th verse of that fourth chapter of Ephesians. But... That is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness and above way of thinking. Putting off the old man, putting on the new man. This is another thought that Paul has given us not only throughout this letter, but throughout all of his letters. The old man must die and the new man must be put on. And must be established in the truth. And what did he say the truth was? The truth is in Jesus. The Oprahs of the world and the New Age gurus of this world will encourage you to proclaim your truth. You proclaim your truth. Well, let me tell you what. That's heresy. There is no truth outside of Jesus and His Word. That is the truth. The Oprahs, they're going to tell you there are many ways to God. There are many roads that lead to God. But we just heard the words of Jesus where He proclaimed, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. That is true. That is the truth. Matt Chandler again, he tells us that we must buy in to the truth and rebuke what is not true. Most of us, Chandler says, fall into sin because we walk according to the lie instead of being able to go, that's not true. We must live the truth in Jesus and in doing that, we have got to stand up and call out the untrue. We have to not only rebuke it, but we have to let everyone know that as we proclaim that is a lie. It's not true. And we can't think or dwell on those things. We must walk in the truth. We must think the truth. We must live in the truth. John Piper states it simply. Jesus is the measure of the truth. Whatever is true, think about these things. The second whatever is whatever is honorable. Honorable, the Greek here means worthy of respect. Do our thoughts go to the sacred or do we dwell on the profane? Do we, do we think reverent thoughts or do we think irreverent thoughts? Once again, Matt Chandler. Imagine honorable things. 
the salvation of your kids or your grandkids? What is more important, going after things that might give you a temporary rush, but in the long run could tear you apart, or the salvation of your family? What should you dwell on? Think on. Imagine. Which is honorable? Paul in his letter to the Romans, 12th chapter, says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. What is honorable? Is it honorable to seek revenge or to forgive? Which is honorable? What do we think of? Where are our thoughts? Where do they take us? Where do we go? What is worthy of respect to you. Piper says simply, shun the dishonest and the shameful. Whatever is honorable, think about these things. Third, whatever, whatever is just, and we know that God is a God of justice. It's something He cares deeply about. It's something that's part of His nature. He is a just God. Just to do what is right, to seek righteousness. So what is righteousness? The psalmist tells us, 48th Psalm, As your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. The 119th Psalm, Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. Psalm 145, 17, The Lord is righteous in all His ways and kind in all His works. So what is righteous? God is righteous. To be righteous is to be morally right or good. In this time that we see ourselves in during this pandemic, during COVID-19, there's a lot of debate the restrictions that have been placed on us as citizens. There's been restrictions placed on us as a church body. And, and we can debate our First Amendment rights through the Constitution. That's not for us tonight. But we can, we can debate that. Does the government have any authority to tell a church you can't meet or you can't do this or you can't do that? Do they have that authority? And that's a debate that some are having in our world. But in our local body right here, in our attempt to do what is right, to be just, we have tried our best to do exactly what our leaders, our civic leaders, our government leaders have told us to do. We, we've changed our services. We went online. We did drive through church. When they said it's okay to bring some back in, we, we brought some back in. Our small groups are not meeting in person, face to face. They're all over Zoom or some other virtual platform. We've tried our best. We wear masks when we come inside. So we have tried our best to be just, to do what is right, whether you believe they have that right to tell us or they don't have that right to tell us. But we're trying to do what is right and to be just. That's what we should be dwelling on in our minds, what we should be thinking about. Whatever is just, think about these things. Our fourth whatever is whatever is pure, undefiled, morally clean, no spot, no, spot, no blemish. This is a description of the type of sacrifice that's needed to pay for my sin and for your sins. And it is not us. <laughs> we are not pure. Matter of fact, the only one who has ever worn flesh on this earth that is pure, that's, that's one person, that's one man. Peter describes him in 1 Peter 2, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Who is that one that was pure? Of course, it's Jesus. And I hope you're starting to see a pattern in these whatevers and what we are to think on and dwell on. Jesus is the standard. So are our thoughts on Jesus 
Because if they're not on Him, if they're on anything below Him, they're not where they should be. We have not met the standard. Jesus is that standard. Sadly, John Piper points out that some in our world today do not operate under the principle of purity. It's not something they even consider. Many people live their life as if being pure is not something to aspire to. It's not value. You let a young lady sign a vow of purity to keep herself sexually pure until her marriage night and see what grief she receives. To see what kind of treatment she receives. What kind of scorn and ridicule she would come under by making that vow. What about us? What about us? Where are our thoughts? Are they on pure? Are they on the undefiled? Whatever is pure. Think about these things. Our fifth whatever. Whatever is lovely. This is from the Greek meaning pleasing or amiable. Charles Ryrie defines it as winsome. That is something that is attractive or appealing in appearance or character. Do we think, keep our thoughts on things of high character? Or do we allow ourselves to sink low onto the unappealing, to the shameful of this world? Piper, simply, don't fill your mind with ugly. Whatever is lovely, think about these things. And our sixth and final whatever is whatever is commendable. Some of your translations probably say whatever is of good report. John MacArthur again says this, this is things that are highly regarded or thought well of. Things that are reputable. Things like kindness and courtesy. Being respectful of others. Do our thoughts go to the respective, to the respectful, to the kindness? Or our thoughts on revenge, unkindness, disrespect? Commendable, are we commendable? Do we think and dwell on commendable, high character? Piper, don't fill your mind with things that are offensive. Whatever is commendable, think about these things. Then he adds two more descriptive thoughts to these six whatevers. In that he says, if there is any excellence, and man, he has set the bar high when he's talking about what if there's anything excellent. Once again, that's not me, and, I, and I'm going to dare say it's not you either. Whatever is excellent. And he adds to that, if there is anything worthy of praise, and he shot the bar all the way into the heavens now, because I know of only, only one who is worthy of praise. The words of John the Revelator in Revelation 4.11 Worthy are you, O our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and, for, and by your will they existed and were created. Worthy are you, Lord. Is that where our thoughts are? Is that where our minds are throughout the day? Praise to you because you alone, O oh God, are worthy of our praise. Where are our thoughts? Where do they take us? You see, Paul isn't telling us just to reject bad, but he's telling us to fill our minds, and by doing that, we're filling our hearts and our souls with good. And what is good? Everything that we've talked about, every one of these whatevers points us to the good. The good is in one, and that one is Jesus. It's 
So our thoughts should be on Jesus and His Word. We should meditate on it. Meditate on Him and meditate on the Word all the time. Not the things of this world. And then, as we move to the ninth verse, Paul tells us not only to think about these things, but he says this, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. So in verse 7, he tells us as we make our requests without worry or anxiety or fear, the peace of God will guard our minds. And here he's saying that as we practice these things, the God of peace will be with us. So we'll not only have the peace of God guarding us, but we'll have the God of peace with us, walking with us every step of our journey. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And this is not a new thought by Paul, not even a new thought in this letter, because we saw over the third chapter, the 17th verse, brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Paul is saying, follow me as I follow Jesus. And follow those among you who are attempting to emulate Christ in their lives. That's your example. That's who you follow. That's what you practice. And no doubt, if, if someone is following Jesus, he's thinking and dwelling on all those whatevers. Well, if someone is following you, where are you taking them? Will they find their way to heaven? Are we even bold enough to tell someone, follow me as I follow Christ? Do we have enough faith in us that we are indeed following Christ so if they do follow us, they'll find their way? Are we clinging to the cross? Are we showing that example by practicing these things, by exercising our thoughts and our minds on these things, we begin to take on the mind of Christ because we're strengthening our spirits. We're strengthening our minds. We're strengthening our hearts. Join in imitating me. I am so thankful for a mom and a dad who showed me the example of living as a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm blessed. I am blessed. I pray that I could partly do what they have done for me. I pray that I did that with my kids. And then let's look at that word as I close. Practice. Practice. Matt Chandler tells us in commentating on this that by telling us to practice, Paul is, is emphasizing that these things are not natural to us. They are not easy. Rejoice in all things. Paul tells us earlier in the fourth chapter to uh, rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. But it's not natural to rejoice when we've been hurt when we've been slandered or rejected or ridiculed, when the news wasn't good, when things didn't go the way we wanted them to go, we feel betrayed, we feel hurt, we feel downcast, we might even feel angry. It's not natural to rejoice. It's not natural when something difficult happens to us to rejoice, to praise. It's not even natural to lay all our anxiety down because we want to carry it. We want to try to handle it. But Paul, through the Word, through the Spirit, is telling us, quit trying to handle it. Don't be anxious. Don't be fearful. Don't worry. Lay it down in your request to God and His peace will guard our minds. 
and our hearts. So we've got to practice. And practicing is not a one-time event. We don't practice once and go out and play a game. You practice continuously over and over and over attempting to reach perfection. We practice and we practice. In a choir, you don't pick up a song and sing through it one time and then go out and sing it. You practice and you practice and you practice it. It's something that's ongoing. It's time consuming. It takes effort. It takes purpose to practice. Paul tells us to practice, to meditate, to consider and ponder, to think on these whatevers, and to follow the example of those faithful who went before us, the example of Paul, my mom, my dad, those before you that lived the life of Christ before you. Follow those examples so that others can Follow us. And knowing that as we are practicing, as we are exercising, as we are meditating, God is at work in us, conforming us into the image of His Son. And then one day, when we see Him face to face, practice time will be over. I leave you with this final thought from Matt Chandler. The maturing man or woman, when tempted, when those thoughts of worry, anxiety, doubt come at them, they run to the Lord, not away from Him. They hand their anxiety over to Him. They humble themselves and trust Him in His answer, whatever it may be. All the while, in their mind, they are dwelling on what is true and right, what is honorable, what is excellent, what is just, what is lovely, mind and heart in sync, maturing unto the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank You for these words that You gave to the Apostle Paul to deliver not only to the Philippians, but to deliver to us this church right now for this moment in time. God, I pray that we would take heed to these words, that we would practice and exercise and meditate on You and on Your Word, on Jesus Christ our Savior. Help us to meet that challenge and to put aside any and everything else and to think and meditate and dwell on you and you alone. And we'll give you all praise and all glory and all honor. In the lovely name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.